welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on uh, this Wednesday evening crosstalk as we move very quickly uh, toward Christmas. We're uh, past the third week in Advent, uh, and we're also spending time in our little devotional book, uh, Devotions for Advent uh, from the Mosaic Bible. And uh, this is a great season of the year, and Nathaniel, can you believe how fast things are moving? Uh, unfortunately, yes, but it is it is coming up quick. It's coming up quick. We're just just a very few days away from the celebration of Christ's birth. As we've gone through um, Advent, you'll notice that we've been moving kind of through a progression. Uh, we've really been on a journey, and that journey began with this sort of idea of dissatisfaction. Um, it's okay, you know, to be dissatisfied with the way the world is. Um, and so... I Not think, only is it okay, sometimes it's the only appropriate way to feel. <laughs> well, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, it's appropriate, it's the only way to feel, and boy, a lot of people, I think, are caught up uh, in being dissatisfied with what we see around us. But the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, allows us to move through that dissatisfaction to hope. And uh, Nathaniel, we were talking about hope last week, but it what about that kind of hope? It sort of doesn't have, in, in one sense, you're not really sure what to do with it. Right, well, um, one of the things that we talked about last week is how tricky hope can be. And you, this reality that you know, other cultures before us have recognized that if we're not careful and if we place our hope in the wrong thing, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. And so maybe it's just better not to hope. Um, but the other side of that is, and uh, I wish that I would have used this metaphor more last week, it, you know, if we just think about investing money, it's an easy, uh, easy metaphor. You know, if you see something to invest in that has got great foundation, it's got a great track record. Um, it's There's no reason for you to, to um, doubt it in any way. Then, you know, that's not a, a bad thing to speculate in. Um, conversely, you know, if it sounds too good to be true or um, <laughs> if there's absolutely no backing to it, then you know you're gonna get burned. Same thing happens with hope. A lot of it depends on the, the character, the, um, uh, the integrity of the person or the thing that we're hoping in. And when it comes to Christmas, one of the things that I appreciate about the reading so far is they've placed Jesus' birth within a bigger context mm -hmm. and within a bigger hope. So Jesus' birth is one part of this larger vision of God's future that we're given in Scripture. And so some of our readings have taken us back to places like Isaiah that give us a broader vision of what God intends for the future. And then we see at Christmas the way that Jesus begins to fit into that. Um, and the other thing that we pick up from the readings so far um, is this uh, history of God's dealings with his people. So again, you know, if you're thinking about investing and you go back and do your research, that's, that's what this is. This is the record, the ledger of how God has interacted with his people. And the witness of lots of people in scripture, and I hope the witness of lots of us today, is that when we look back, we can say that God has been faithful. And while there have been hard periods where we felt abandoned or we felt like we were on our own, the, the overwhelming tendency is towards God's faithfulness, and we have to be honest in confessing that. And that also gives us confidence to hope, to place our hope in this vision of God's future and what God is doing. So in that hope, I, I really like what you're saying. It, it um, demands a little bit of research on, sure. on our part uh, to go back and to look at Scripture, um, and not just the words of Scripture, but the history behind all of those words of Scripture, the history that that Scripture represents. We go back uh, 800 years before the birth of Christ, or a little less than that, to the time of Isaiah, and then even on back to Adam and Eve in the Genesis story, you know, gives us that uh, promise that uh, the woman's seed is going to, to bruise the, the 
or her heel is going to crush the serpent. So, you know, we get all of these sorts of um, premonitions and promises that are coming off through millennia um, that, that point to God's faithfulness, as you say. God's faithfulness in this steady vision of God's future. And, it, you know, God has in store God's idea, God's vision is a, a world that's whole, a world that's not like ours. It's not subject to brokenness and greed and death and all of that stuff. Um, but a world that's been reconciled, a world that's been mended, um, a world that's whole again. So we, we find ourselves in, in a story that, that has a past, but it takes us past the present into this envisioned sure. future. Absolutely. And we begin to see that Christmas is just a part of it. And that as good as the gift of Christmas is, having received Jesus... It's not everything. It's not the whole story. It's not the whole hope. There's still work to be done. And we have that double meaning of Advent that um, that I hope that we're all aware of. Advent is just a Latin word that means arrival. Um, we remember Jesus' first arrival, but we also look forward to Jesus' second arrival. And that's a little bit where we end up with today. That's it, and, and I guess there's that third arrival when we begin to think of the Holy Spirit coming into our, our present life, and then uh, what the uh, devotion calls this active anticipation. Mm -hmm. we, we begin to work, and we have things to do, so we're not just uh, paralyzed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of in a hopeful place, but we don't know what to do next, we don't know ex what to expect next, but... Rather, you know, we're in this hopeful place, and now we have some things to do. Right. And that, to me, seems like such a um, healthy uh, spiritual sort of life where we begin to move from dissatisfaction, uh, moving toward hopefulness, and then moving toward, uh, okay, now we've got something to do, actually, mm -hmm. and it's meaningful sort of uh, work. So that's spiritually healthy, but I think it's also emotionally healthy. Sure. Um, and, you know, we were talking a lot in our culture today about emotional and mental health. And I think, you know, maybe, you know, that's part of the missing uh, reality in a lot of people's lives. They're, they're dissatisfied, but they don't know what to do with it. They haven't heard the gospel. They haven't heard any good news. Instead, they're picking up on a lot of negativity. What what do you see out there in the culture, media-wise, movie-wise, that, that sort of thing, Nathaniel, as far as what is the future vision of secular America today? Yeah, well, and just going back to your point on, on mental health, uh, Eve had her uh, holiday program. They presented it with her school a couple weeks ago, and the principal for her elementary school got up, and the first thing that came out of his mouth was, we're concerned about mental health here and mm -hmm. if you are concerned about it please don't ever be afraid to come and talk to us we want to get you plugged into resources and that was an elementary school yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah i mean that is a major concern yeah um and yeah i mean we were a a, a culture that it's in a, in a hard place um for any of you who you know spend a lot of time on netflix or in the movie theater um, or just plain watching TV, or if you're interested in, you know, books, any sort of fiction kind of stuff. I think the overwhelming move now is still towards sort of apocalyptic stories. And by apocalyptic, I mean stories that have to do with the end of humankind. And it can be from anything like natural disasters, uh, tsunamis or earthquakes or asteroids, to aliens coming to get us to uh, zombies coming to get us, whether it be just total fiction or whether it be zombies created by some you know, human mistake, um, whether it be war, uh, nuclear fallout, whatever, uh, the imagination of the media anyway seems to be completely taken away with the end. And I think some of it is out of fear and I think some of it is just out of people wanting the end to come which sounds like a funny thing to say and, and uh, you're free to disagree but do some talking around with people and start paying attention to the stickers that people put on their cars and 
I think we're a culture that is increasingly fascinated with death, um, increasingly enamored with death. Um, because when you're dissatisfied and you don't have anything to do, what do you do but just wait for the end? And how much better for the end to come instead of just having to sit around and wait for it? Yeah, and, and we see that, I think, as you say, on stickers, there's uh, on cars, a lot of skull type things that are that are on cars. Um, we see it, I think, you know, in the gang violence, the hopelessness of um, many neighborhoods and with guns and oh, just uh, yeah. flushed into our, our culture. Um, there's this, this violence uh, that is just on the move. Well, and, it, and again, you know, if you just listen to interviews and talk to people, yes, there is violence and a love of guns uh, among the uh, the outlaws, but there's also violence and a love of guns and a love of, of gun violence among, you know, people that we would consider good, decent folks. They're itching to shoot somebody. And again, that just... It, it shows you that maybe something is not right, right. when we are when we actively want to shoot somebody. <laughs> so <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> so there is, I think, you know, it's fair to say there is this death wish sure. that um, that expresses itself in many different ways uh, in our culture today. So it's it's this very unhealthy dissatisfaction moving into hopelessness and not knowing what to do and acting out in incredibly inappropriate and harmful ways to self and to others. Mm -hmm. but, but as opposed to that, uh, bringing back the focus to the Christian uh, reality and, and the, the life that we're offered in Christ, we move from dissatisfaction to hopefulness and then to activity driven by this future vision. And I just love the readings from Romans chapter eight uh, that we were given this week um, that sort of paint the picture. Um, being, you know, very realistic about how the world is right now, but moving beyond the world uh, now to what God's hope is. And uh, forgive me, but I just want to read um, this entire section uh, from Romans chapter 8. I think it is so powerful. It drives us into the future. Paul says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, creation looks forward to the day when it will be uh, join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We are given this hope when we are saved. If we already have something that we don't uh, need, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. So Nathaniel, here's this vision of, of all of creation being healed and literally standing on its tiptoes, just, just waiting um, for, for healing and freedom from death and decay. What do you think about this vision? Yeah, well, again, it, to me, it takes us back to last week in this hope for what God is going to do. But I think we still have to be careful about uh, what we do with our hope. Uh, okay, we've heard the good news, now what? Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I giggle about in our culture is um, we are increasingly a culture who everything is specialized and you, if you've got a question, then you hire a specialist. And my experience a lot of time with people is like, okay, we've got a vision, who do we got to hire to make it happen? And 
And so it's like, my job is just to write the checks so somebody else can do the work. Um, and sometimes I think that does come into our faith and the church and everything. Uh, okay, Jesus is going to come back. What do I have to do now to make him do it faster kind of stuff? Right, right. Um, and that's not really the hope that we've been called into. I think that you're right that on a larger, just human level, uh, a hope should push us towards action. Mm. A, sh a hope should mobilize us towards moving towards that vision. Absolutely. Um, and then I think that, that that sense of necessity to move on is doubled with the hope that we're given in God's future because God's future, so much of it is dependent on us doing stuff. Mm. God's vision of the future is a new creation where human beings work and live together and interact with one another in healthy, whole ways. Mm. That means that we have to be doing something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so not only does proper hope move us towards action, but the hope, the specific hope that we're given in Scripture is one that requires us to do stuff. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea so much that, um, you know, we get this idea that, you know, God's coming toward us and, you know, God's going to take care of everything. And so we don't, we can just wait and, you know, receive. Beam me up, beam beam me up, up. Scotty. Just <laughs> but, but this idea that, that we're called now to be part of that new creation in the present. Um, and Paul talks about very clear here what his vision is but also very clear about we're groaning now. Uh, there's just something inside of us that's aching for that day. And then he talks about waiting patiently. Um, you know, he says toward the end here, you know, if we already have something, we don't have to hope for it. So he's talking about this, this kind of patient waiting. And the vision that I get from that, Nathaniel, the kind of mental picture, is that as we wait patiently, uh, we work and, and we can almost be satisfied with small things. I mean, we don't have to, you know, have the, the whole picture. We don't have to have the whole story. We don't have to have complete victory. But just as we patiently wait to be involved in small things uh, that, that do make a difference uh, in, in the world in which we live. Well, so forgive me for being ultra personal here. And um, I don't want to bore you with things about our lives. But um, the image that comes to my mind is over the past, uh, I don't know, 18 months or so, um, Mary and I had felt like it was time for us to try and find a house. We'd been renting um, up where we lived in Madison for a, quite a few years. And we thought that, you know, it's time. If we're going to try and get a house, now is it. And, you know, inevitably you go through the process of looking at different places and you get your hopes up. Oh, this is the one. Yeah, right. Mary and I laugh about it. Or you drive away from a place and it's like, are you already dreaming? Oh, yeah, I'm already dreaming. What would it be like to be here? And uh, so you have this hope. And uh, at least, well, more than once, we had the experience of, you know, getting pretty far into the process. You know, you make offers and stuff and you hope and you hope and hope. And then... Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Um, but one of the things that we decided early on in the process was regardless of what the, you know, the actual house was going to be at the end, there was going to be a house. And we could start cleaning up. We could start packing. We could start going through our stuff that, you know, and get rid of stuff that we know that we were never going to use again. And then when the day came and we did find a house, and it's a really wonderful place, and we... Uh, want to invite people and, and share it with everybody but um when we finally found the place work had been done towards it that made it a lot easier um and it was still a big moving day dad knows all about that <laughs> yeah um it was still a process move, though. yeah you, you get rid of a lot of stuff it I mean, was still a good process but you know you had this in vision that wasn't realized yet but it's like hey there's all this stuff that i can be doing along the way to make it easier when it gets here, to be ready when the day actually comes. So Paul tells us in Romans to wait, but we have another reading uh, in our readings for this week from Luke chapter 3, and it's John the Baptist raking everybody over the coals. And um, 
be glad that John the Baptist is not your preacher. <laughs> um, the crowds came out to John for baptism. So he said to them, you brood of snakes, who warned you to flee from God's coming wrath? <laughs> Prove by the way that you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe because we're descendants of Abraham. That doesn't mean anything. I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. So John's message is in your face. Yeah. Um, but John calls his listeners to something that's more than just waiting patiently. He calls them to start working along towards this future that God has promised. And uh, at the end of his reading, he begins to explain to him what that looks like. The people asked, what should we do? So John gives them some ideas. If you really hope in God's future, if you really believe that Jesus is Messiah and is going to bring this whole new creation into being, if we really believe in that hope, then if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. And if you have food, share it with people that are hungry. Corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked, what should we do? And John told them, collect no more taxes than the government requires. Stop ripping people off. And the soldiers asked, what should we do? And John told them, don't extort money or make false accusations. Be content with your pay. So John has these very concrete ways that we can anticipate which is the name of this week anticipate this future that god is bringing we're gonna move one day you know what we might as well start packing right <clears throat> well I, I never uh cease to be amazed we read this every year um and you know here's john as you said just really just leveling these people out Going I mean, just, the <laughs> yeah just you know <laughs> and not gracious <laughs> not gracious at all just calling them names and everything but then, you know, when they, they say, well, what, what should we do? I mean, in my own mind, I'm expecting what I think, uh, again, um, it's, it's somewhere between evasion of responsibility, it's misunderstanding, it's, it's just sort of a, a warped uh, view of God and of supernatural things. But, you know, I think some people would expect, oh, you know, walk across coals to prove that you're really repentant or... Go live in the desert with hair shirts and we like restrict to feel your bad. diet. Yeah, yeah, we like to be guilty and we like to feel bad. Yeah, or, or you know, do some sort of, you know, go find the Holy Grail, you know, go off on some some mission of some sort. Be we, really serious and feel really bad. <laughs> yeah, and, and do something you probably can't do, but, you know, do this miraculous thing. You know, I'm just, just waiting for this kind of, these, you know, hurdles to be crossed. And, and then he comes out with this, what can we do to get ready for the coming? Well, you, you know, basically tell the truth and tell the steal truth and be nice be to people. Be generous. Don't rip people off. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, all. John, is that all you got? Is that, yeah. yeah that's, it's all very basic stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just soldiers. He doesn't ask them to quit the army. He just says, don't, you know, harass people. Don't and, misuse your... Don't position be, of power. Don't abuse your power. Don't abuse your power. You've got power. Don't abuse it. Mm -hmm. uh, to the tax collectors, no, be, just be honest in your tax collection. And then, you know, share what you have. I mean, these be are generous. these simple things. So um, that's exciting to me that um, what God is doing and what he's asking us to do is, is actually possible. Well, and, and I will say this too, you know, as we are presented with this vision of God's future, it is very idealistic. And I think a lot of people will say, you admit that, hopefully, yeah, it's very idealistic. And some people are very honest, and that's, and it's also very naive, it's just not going to happen. And if we try to do that stuff today, it's wasted time. You know, why should we be generous? It's not going to fix anything, it's not going to change anything. Um, you know, why should we act with integrity if that's just going to put us behind our competition? Um, but the answer that's given again and again in Scripture throughout the Old Testament, in the words of Jesus and in the words of the other New Testament writers, is that God is going to make this future happen. And anything that we do, getting ready for that new future is not done in vain. 
Did it make a huge difference that we could tell right now? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But it wasn't done in vain. And when the day comes, it's just like putting all those books on your bookshelf in boxes. It will have a place. It will have had meaning. It will have been important. I, I really uh, appreciate, too, uh, the way this uh, sort of lesson uh, includes Psalm 126. It's one of my favorite psalms. And, uh, you know, Nathaniel, we talked about the smallness of these things, how some people would say, you know, you know, in the ancient world, I mean, you know, ideas of, of kindness, ideas of forgiveness were not um, thought to be very valuable in the pagan ancient world. Um, Those are not virtues. The, but the, the Christian virtues of these small things of being kind, um, of, of forgiving. Um, Psalm 126, I think, compares them to planting the seed. And if we're willing to plant the seed right now, you know, you go out with a little seed, and uh, uh, they weep as they go out to plant their seed, the psalmist says. And um, I guess there are a lot of reasons we might want to weep when we're planting these seeds. It's, it seems small. Um, oh, and it feels like you're giving away your future. And it it's a gamble. It, it is, and that's, that's exactly, I guess, what farmers do every spring. They give away their boy, future. Boy, I hope these things grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, and that that's it. So you're weeping as you 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 uh, you plant the seed, uh, but then when the harvest comes in, uh, then there's the the, the the incredible joy in, in the song. They plant in tears, and they harvest with shouts of joy. And uh, and Jesus just tells so many parables about the seed and about the growth of the seed in the kingdom, and so these kinds of very small things. Uh, that, that we think we might be doing that are so counterintuitive, maybe countercultural to be sure, uh, but these are, are planting the kingdom and God's watering it, God's at work, and uh, something wonderful is rushing toward us, uh, not gloom and doom, uh, not the apocalypse, that uh, zombie that. apocalypse, but what is rushing toward us is new heaven, new earth, um, well, it's life itself is yeah. rushing towards us. Yeah, yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's not death, it's life. <laughs> we're rushing, yeah. I mean, that's a wonderful way of looking at it. Uh, and so different from the world who thinks we're moving toward death. Christians move or moving toward life. Well, so I guess we uh, end with the, the question, maybe, Nathaniel. Um, what are those small things that we're given to do uh, as we move on toward the Christmas season? I know um, it's a stressful time. For, for probably all of us with all of these huge expectations that we put on ourselves and even put on others. But uh, we're in this movement uh, toward the celebration of the birth of Jesus. Can we just take a breath and um, remember the, the life that is coming toward us? Uh, remember that we're called to hope and also we've been empowered to do really what many people might think were just small things, but what are those small things that we can do? Uh, sow the seeds that are anticipating the kingdom. Well, I will say this. Um, it's going to be different for every one of our situations. As many of us as there is, there will be different ways that we can anticipate. And I think the only thing that we can say for all of us in this season is I think the best thing we can do is just you know, instead of focusing so much on ourselves <clears throat> and our busy schedules and our tight checkbooks and all of the stuff that we have to get done so that we can enjoy Christmas, my challenge to you would just be to look around you and take a minute to ask other people where they are. And I think the opportunities to do these small things will arise. Um, if we can just take a second to stop looking at us and look at other people there will be more than enough small opportunities uh, for us to serve. I'm sure. Uh, so, Nathaniel, thank you for joining us uh, tonight as we move on toward the Christmas season, and thank all of you for joining us. Um, again, I'll just close with one of the prayers uh, that are uh, listed in our uh, meditation uh, from the Sarum Breviary from England about 1085. I that's love when this. The Vikings were coming through. That's when the Vikings were, yeah, the, the Viking invasions. A dark time in many ways uh, for the English people. But here again, 
this record that stretches back into <clears throat> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then we have this, this you know, 11th century uh, prayer that's given to us, and we have our prayers today. So let's end on this historic prayer that reminds us of God's faithfulness. We beseech thee, O Lord, let our hearts be graciously enlightened by your holy radiance, that we may serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life, that so we may escape the darkness of this world and by thy guidance attain the land of eternal brightness. Through your mercy, O blessed Lord, who dost live and govern all things, world without end. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. God bless you as we move toward the Christmas season. I look forward to being with you next Wednesday night.